Number 15. The Disappearance of Antoinette Caidezio On April 6, 1986, Antoinette Caidezio, a vibrant and curious nine-year-old girl, was at home in Gallup, New Mexico with her two younger siblings, Wendy and Senada, under the supervision of a babysitter while their mother, Penny, went out to socialize at a bar with her friends. Around midnight, Penny returned home, intoxicated, and sent the babysitter on her way, assuming her children were safely asleep in the adjoining room. Tragically, Penny's judgment was impaired, and she failed to comprehend the potential dangers of leaving her children unattended in her inebriated state. With Penny asleep, the eerie silence of the early morning was abruptly shattered by a loud and forceful knock on the door sometime after 3.30 a.m. Startled and disoriented, Antoinette and her sister Wendy awoke, uncertain of what was happening. As the older sibling, Antoinette took the initiative to approach the door, hoping to find out who was outside. Antoinette asked, Who's this? A man, feigning familiarity, replied, Uncle Joe. The girls did have an uncle named Joe, but this was an imposter taking advantage of their innocence. Antoinette cautiously opened the door, only to be confronted with a stranger's visage. The unknown man wasted no time and forcibly seized Antoinette, silencing her cries for help and dragging her away from the safety of her home. As Wendy helplessly watched her sister being taken, she couldn't comprehend the gravity of the situation. Her young mind struggled to grasp the enormity of the tragedy unfolding before her eyes. In the meantime, Penny, who was still inebriated, was sound asleep, completely unaware of the nightmare that was taking place just outside her bedroom door. Little did she know that her life was about to be forever altered. When she woke up the next morning and found her daughter missing, Penny was panicked. She spent the next four hours searching the neighborhood, calling out for Antoinette, hoping against hope that her daughter had simply wandered off. Her frantic efforts were met with nothing. None of the neighbors she spoke to had seen her daughter, and she slowly began to realize that Antoinette was nowhere to be found. The devastating truth hit Penny like a tidal wave, and she contacted the police at 11 a.m. to report her daughter's disappearance. Unfortunately, Due to a rule at the time requiring an eight-hour waiting period before filing a missing persons report, precious time had already slipped away before law enforcement could launch a proper investigation. As days turned into weeks and weeks into months, the search for Antoinette intensified, with police and volunteers scouring the area around her home. However, despite their dedicated efforts, no trace of Antoinette surfaced, much to the dismay of her family. One year later, a glimmer of hope emerged when the Gallup police station received an unexpected and chilling phone call. A young girl, claiming to be Antoinette, spoke in a trembling voice, revealing that she was being held in Albuquerque. The call was cut short by a male voice, and the line went dead, leaving investigators with both hope and despair. Despite their best efforts, they found no evidence of Antoinette in Albuquerque. Authorities were frustrated and discouraged by the lack of leads in the investigation. In 1991, a possible sighting of Antoinette in Carson City renewed hope, but it too ultimately led to a dead end. Penny passed away in 1999, never knowing the truth about what happened to her daughter. Today, Antoinette would be 45 years old. Despite the passage of time, law enforcement and concerned citizens have not given up hope of finding Antoinette and bringing her home. Her image and information are continuously circulated by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in the hope that someone, somewhere, holds the key to solving this heart-wrenching mystery. If you have any information relating to Antoinette Cayadito's disappearance, please contact the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800. 843-5678. The smallest detail could be the breakthrough that leads to the resolution of this decades-old mystery. Number 14. The Doddleston Messages In the autumn of 1984, in the village of Doddleston, Cheshire, England, economics teacher Ken Webster was renovating an 18th-century cottage where he lived with his girlfriend, Debbie. Strange occurrences began shortly after they moved in, with mysterious six-toed footprints appearing on the walls. Initially, they suspected each other of playing pranks inspired by the cottage's history. But as time passed, more eerie events unfolded, including chalk marks, cold spots, and strange noises. Things took an even stranger turn when they discovered mysterious messages on a borrowed computer, supposedly from a man named Lucas Wainman, who lived and died in the 1500s. True are the nightmares of a person that fears. Safe are the bodies of the silent world. Turn, pretty flower, turn towards the sun, for you shall grow and sow. But the flower reaches too high and withers in the burning light. Get out your bricks, pussycat. Pussycat went to London to seek fame and fortune. Faith must not be lost, for this shall be your redeemer. A few days after the mysterious poem appeared, another message arrived. 
I write on behalf of many. What strange words you speak. You are a worthy, good man who has a fanciful woman, and you live in my house, who dwell in my home, with lights which the devil makes. It was a great crime to have stolen, bribed, my house. Signed, L.W. Through these messages, Lucas claimed to have once lived in Meadow Cottage over 500 years before, during the time of King Henry VIII of England. Lucas shared details of his life, including his role as a farmer, his tragic loss of his wife and son to the plague, and his encounters with philosopher Erasmus. As the messages continued, Lucas indicated that the computer had been brought to him by someone named One from the year 2109. The messages from 2109 spoke in cryptic New Age terms about higher purposes and guidance. The messages from Lucas and 2109 continued for about 18 months, revealing a complex tale involving time travel and interdimensional communication. Try to understand that you three have a purpose that shall in your lifetime change the face of history. We, 2109, must not affect your thoughts directly, but give you some sort of guidance that will allow room for your own destiny. All we can say is that we are all part of the same God, whatever he is, is. The authenticity of the Doddleston messages came under scrutiny. Language experts analyzed the messages and found discrepancies, suggesting that they were not genuine Tudor English. Some theorized that Ken Webster and his girlfriend might have orchestrated an elaborate hoax, starting as pranks and later becoming a complex narrative. Ken wrote a book about the experience, and some theorized that the story was an elaborate form of promotion. Eventually, the Society for Psychical Research, or SPR, was called in to investigate, but they found no conclusive evidence and left without witnessing any paranormal activity. Despite the initial intrigue, interest in the Doddleston messages waned over time, and Ken Webster and his girlfriend disappeared from the public eye. The authenticity of the messages remains uncertain, leaving the Doddleston messages as a peculiar mystery that could be a product of elaborate storytelling or a paranormal enigma. Number 13. The Disappearance of Ben McDaniel Benjamin Wayne McDaniel was born on April 15, 1980, in Memphis, Tennessee. He was the eldest of Shelby and Patty McDaniel's three children. Growing up in Collierville, Tennessee, he developed a passion for scuba diving, which he pursued avidly from the age of 15. McDaniel became a certified open water diver and was working towards becoming a cave diver. In April 2010, after facing personal challenges, including a divorce, a failed construction business, and the loss of his younger brother in 2008, McDaniel decided to take a break from the stress and moved to his parents' beach house in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. He frequently dived in the fresh waters of Vortex Spring, a popular spot near his parents' home. In early August 2010, McDaniel visited his parents in Tennessee and shared his plans to become a diving instructor and start a diving-related business. After returning to Florida, Ben quickly became a regular diver at the Vortex Spring. With its sparkling transparent waters and constant 68-degree Fahrenheit temperatures, the spring is a calling to any experienced divers worldwide, with only 1% managing to dive to its depths. Yet Vortex Spring's allure has been tinged with tragedy. Over the course of a decade, 13 divers tragically lost their lives, prompting Florida authorities to contemplate shutting down the caves entirely. Ultimately, a middle ground was found, resulting in the implementation of a gate that grants entry solely to certified divers who have presented the appropriate certifications and signed a liability release. A haunting sign serves as a poignant reminder of the lurking hazards within the depths. The sign reads, Stop. Prevent your death. Go no farther. Along with the ominous figure of a grim reaper, Ben had an open water certification and aspirations to achieve further certifications and open his own dive business. He had become well known to the employees due to his regular diving schedule. Although it was discouraged to dive alone, Ben often embarked on solitary late night dives. On August 18, 2010, he was seen donning a helmet, indicating his intention to explore the cave. Familiar with his habits, an employee named Taryn decided to open the lock to the cave gate for Ben, allowing him access. However, Taryn and another employee, Cronin, clocked out for the day before Ben had resurfaced. Two days later, when Ben's truck remained parked in the Vortex Springs lot, authorities were notified and the search efforts commenced. Cadaver dogs alerted to a scent trail leading to the spring, and an underwater search was conducted. Outside the cave, two tanks belonging to Ben were found, 
Given the complexity and danger of cave diving recovery, the help of highly skilled divers was required. Sixteen divers spent an arduous 36 days searching the caves, and Ed Sorensen, an experienced cave diver and recovery specialist, ventured deeper into the cave than anyone had ever done before. Nineteen months after Ben took his final dive, David Twist, commander of HELP, the search and rescue dog team, stepped forward as a volunteer to aid in the search for Ben. Diligently exploring the woods and surrounding areas, he investigated various theories above the water's surface. Though Twist knew there was yet to be concrete evidence that Ben was in the cave, he felt that something must have happened to him within that vicinity. In their quest for answers, investigators conducted over 30 tests on the waters of Vortex Spring, any signs of unusual bacteria that could lead them closer to a specific location. Unfortunately, these tests yielded no significant findings. Stranger still, they found no evidence to suggest a body was decomposing in the waters beyond their reach. They began to question if Ben was ever in the cave at all. Amidst the search, a Vortex Springs employee suggested a theory that Ben orchestrated his own death to start a new life elsewhere. However, the McDaniels vehemently rejected this notion, emphasizing that after the loss of their son Paul, their elder child would never put them through such distress again. They pointed to the fact that he had left his beloved rescue dog, Spooner, unattended at the beach house that day, which contradicted the idea of him intentionally disappearing. Moreover, Ben had recently embarked on a promising new relationship and had expressed his aspirations of becoming a certified diving instructor and eventually starting his own business. Despite extensive searches by divers, Ben's body was never found. Authorities found no evidence of foul play, and the case remains classified as a missing persons case. In 2013, Florida declared McDaniel legally dead. His family offered a substantial reward of $30,000 for information leading to his location or body, but later rescinded it to prevent inexperienced divers from getting hurt during the search. To this day, no trace of Ben has ever been found. Number 12. The Murder of Jeanette De Palma Jeanette De Palma's life began on August 3, 1956, in the tranquil New Jersey suburb of Springfield Township. Raised in a devout Christian home, she enjoyed an upper-middle-class upbringing alongside her siblings. On August 3, 1972, Jeanette celebrated her 16th birthday. Being deeply connected to her faith, the festivities were modest, eschewing traditional partying. Five days later, on August 7, Jeanette told her mother of plans to take the train to her friend's house. Sadly, Jeanette never made it there. Later that evening, when Jeanette failed to return home, her parents notified the police and an investigation was quickly launched. Over the next six weeks, searches were conducted, flyers were handed out, and appeals were made begging anyone with information as to the 16-year-old's whereabouts to come forward, but leads were sparse. It wasn't until September 19, 1972, when a break in the case was finally made. That day, a dog returned to its owner from playing outside, clutching a decomposing human arm in its jaws, the hand still attached. The authorities were immediately called, and bloodhounds were deployed. The dogs led detectives to the Hudai Quarry near the Wachung Reservation, locally known by the eerie name The Devil's Teeth. Here they found Jeanette's body, lying face down in the dirt, surrounded by wooden crosses and logs set out to look like a coffin. According to some sources, there was also a pentagram drawn close by, and the scene suggested some kind of occult practice. The state of Jeanette's body made identification through dental records necessary, and due to the advanced decomposition, the exact cause of death remained unknown. The coroner speculated strangulation, as there were no obvious signs of trauma. Intriguingly, high lead levels were found in her remains, defying explanation. First at the scene, Officer Donald Schwett speculated during the initial investigation that it might not have been a murder at all, suggesting Jeanette may have succumbed to a drug overdose, abandoned by friends. Yet this explanation seemed inconsistent with Jeanette's staunchly religious personality and way of life. Her friends reported that they did not know her to engage in substance use. In 1973, the FBI joined the case, analyzing Jeanette's clothing but finding no foreign hairs, stains on her blouse, Underwear, bra, and pants raised questions, but their degraded state prevented conclusive identification as to whether they were blood or The FBI ruled out drugs and poison as causes of death. 
In the neighborhood, rumors of occult activities in the woods had circulated for years, making Jeanette's possible link to it unsettling. Despite speculation, no concrete evidence tied her murder to occult practices, leading some to suspect the involvement of a local cult called the Witches, though this remained unproven. A fortnight after the discovery of Jeanette's body, local newspapers circulated articles sensationalizing her death, asserting that witchcraft was responsible. These reports referenced Reverend James Tate, a local evangelist and family friend of the De Palmas, as their source. As the notion of a teenage coven conducting murderous rituals perpetuated and gained traction in the community, law enforcement detained a homeless man who had been residing in the vicinity. However, he was quickly released and ruled out as a suspect. With no further viable leads, the police decided to close the case. Years later, private investigator Ed Salzano took an interest in the case at the request of John Bancy, Jeanette's nephew, who hoped for answers before his own death. Salzano was convinced that some in the Springfield community knew the truth but feared coming forward. He sought to reopen and re-examine the case, filing a lawsuit to test Jeanette's clothing and conduct DNA analysis. Tragically, John Bancy passed away before finding the closure he sought, leaving the mystery of Jeanette De Palma's murder unresolved. Today, the Facebook page Justice for Jeanette De Palma, run by Salzano and his partner, seeks to keep her memory alive and find answers. Springfield's Deputy Mayor Chris Weber, a retired police officer, expressed interest in re-examining the case, as there may be new perspectives and connections waiting to be found. Number 11. The Murder of Missy Beavers Terry Leanne Strickland, lovingly known as Missy, came into this world on August 9, 1970, in Graham, Texas, and grew up as the middle child among her siblings. In 1998, she tied the knot with Brandon Bevers and dedicated herself to being a teaching assistant at a local school. As time passed, Missy and Brandon's family expanded with the arrival of three children, prompting her to take on the role of a devoted stay-at-home mom at their home in Red Oak, Texas. As her children grew older, Missy felt the calling to return to the workforce. Instead of resuming her previous job, fate led her to discover a newfound passion, fitness. Fueled by a desire to share her love for fitness with others, she set out to create a group fitness class called Camp Gladiator for the community in her area. She hosted her classes at the Creekside Church of Christ in Midlothian, only a 20-minute drive from her home. On April 17, 2016, while Brandon was away on his annual fishing trip, Missy was at home with their children. That evening, she took to her Camp Gladiator Facebook page, sharing an uplifting image with the message, If it's raining, we're still training, reminding her followers about the early morning boot camp scheduled the next day. Missy left her home early to set up for the class as she always did. However, as her participants began to gather the next morning at the church, they stumbled upon a horrifying sight. Missy lay lifeless on the floor, surrounded by pools of her own blood. Emergency services were summoned immediately, but it was too late. Missy had endured a severe head injury and multiple stab wounds to her chest, leaving a community devastated and in shock. The police launched an intensive murder investigation, examining surveillance footage from the halls of the church. What they saw on the tape sent shivers down their spines. A person approximately 5 feet 7 inches tall, walking with a noticeable limp, they were dressed in a tactical vest with police emblazoned on both front and back, along with gloves and shin pads. A black helmet obscured the perpetrator's face and identity. Chillingly, this figure was caught strolling through the church halls, wielding a hammer, seemingly casually premeditating the heinous act. Signs of forced entry at the crime scene initially led the police to consider a robbery gone wrong scenario, but it was soon ruled out when they found that nothing was stolen and Missy's wedding ring remained on her finger. As their focus shifted, the authorities looked closer at those closest to Missy, and her husband Brandon came under scrutiny. Evidence of marital and financial issues surfaced from Missy's social media accounts, along with flirtatious messages sent via LinkedIn. However, Brandon provided a solid alibi as he was hundreds of miles away on his fishing trip at the time of the murder. Speculation arose around Randy Bevers, Brandon's father, when he was seen at a dry cleaner with a supposedly bloody woman's shirt. However, further investigation revealed Randy had been in California at the time of Missy's murder. Nine months later, outdoor surveillance footage from a gun store near to the Creekside Church piqued the police's interest, revealing a suspicious Nissan Altima circling the church parking lot on the morning of the murder. After publicizing the footage, an anonymous tip pointed the police towards Bobby Wayne Henry, an ex-police officer working as a security guard. Bobby had a troubling past, having been fired from the police force for aggravated Several factors contributed to the suspicion, 
Bobby's car resembled the one in the surveillance video, and he walked with a limp. A forensic podiatrist's assessment failed to provide a definitive link, and there was not enough evidence to charge him with Missy's murder. Despite the ongoing investigation, the case remains unsolved, leaving Missy's family and the community yearning for answers and seeking justice for the loss of a vibrant, loving, and devoted woman. To this day, despite extensive surveillance footage covering the moments before and after Missy's murder, the mystery remains unsolved. Authorities are still seeking answers and have offered a $10,000 reward for any information that could lead to the arrest and indictment of the suspect. If anyone has pertinent details, they are encouraged to contact the police at 972-937-7297 or the Midlothian Police Department Criminal Investigation Division at 972-775-7634. Number 10. The Disappearance of Stephen Clark Stephen Clark's life was marked by tragedy from a young age. Born in Colchester, Essex in 1969, he lived with his parents, Charles and Doris. At the age of two, Stephen suffered a devastating accident when he wandered out of the house unattended and was hit by a passing truck. He miraculously survived, but was left with permanent physical injuries, including a severely damaged left arm and a pronounced limp. Despite the challenges posed by his disability, Stephen was determined to excel in life. He worked diligently and even received an Apprentice of the Year award for his outstanding studies. Eager to secure employment, he joined the Rathbone Society in Redcar, which aimed to assist disabled individuals in finding work. However, Stephen faced a heart-wrenching reality as potential employers hesitated to hire him due to his disability. On December 28, 1992, an event unfolded that would change Stephen's life forever. Charles Clark had a ticket to attend a Middlesbrough football match, and Stephen wanted to accompany him. Charles, however, insisted that Stephen could only go if he paid for his own ticket. Reluctant to spend his money, Stephen decided not to go to the match. Instead, he and his mother, Doris, went for a long walk along the beach, eventually reaching Saltburn, approximately 45 minutes away from their home. During their walk, Stephen expressed the need to use the restroom, and they stopped at a public bathroom. Doris waited outside for a short while before deciding to use the women's restroom herself. When she came out, she couldn't find Stephen but assumed he was still inside. Doris noticed two men and a little girl near the restrooms. One of the men went inside while the other stayed outside with the girl. Not wanting to intrude, she didn't ask them about Stephen and didn't go in to check on him, stating that he was 23 years old and not a child. After waiting for some time, she assumed Stephen had left without her and headed home. Upon returning home, Stephen was not there, and when Charles arrived, Doris informed him that their son was missing. They immediately set out together to look for him, retracing their steps and searching the bathroom where she had last seen him. After 24 hours had passed since Stephen vanished, his parents contacted the police, and an investigation into his disappearance began. During the initial investigation, Stephen's personal belongings, including his wallet, glasses, and watch, were found untouched at his home in Marsk. The police initially believed the last sighting of Stephen was at 3 p.m. when he entered some toilets in Saltburn. However, following new developments and the subsequent arrest of his parents in September 2020, this information was reconsidered. It was now thought that Stephen was seen walking along High Street towards Marsk Square, heading towards the Ship Inn at approximately 3.45 p.m. that afternoon before it got dark. In November 2020, the police released a letter they had received in 1999 claiming to know who was responsible for Stephen's disappearance. The unreleased letter, sent to Gisborough Police Station, provided precise details about Stephen's alleged fate and the person behind it. Although the letter writer might have passed away since then, the police urged anyone recognizing the handwriting to come forward. In a statement, they said, The letter was sent to Gisborough Police Station and is very precise in nature. The letter writer intimated that Stephen was dead and that they claimed to know the person responsible. It was 21 years ago, so the letter writer could have died since then. But if anyone recognizes the handwriting, we would urge them to get in touch. A month later, a video of Stephen's distinctive walk was released by police in the hopes that it would jog anyone's memory. The writer of the letter came forward in December 2020, marking a potential breakthrough in the case. Four months after their arrest, Charles and Doris were released without charge. In April 2021, the police were reported to be conducting searches on Saltburn Bank's hillside, hoping to uncover clues related to Stephen's disappearance. Despite the efforts and developments in the case, Stephen Clark's fate remains unresolved, leaving his family and authorities still seeking answers. Today, 
his sister appears on podcasts and true crime videos in the hope that someone, somewhere, will see it and provide the missing pieces that will finally bring Stephen home. Anyone with information into the disappearance can call local police on the non-emergency number 101 or Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800-555-111. Number 9. The Disappearance of Alexandria Lowitzer Born on February 3, 1994, Alexandria Ali Lowitzer spent her childhood in Spring, Texas with her parents, Joe Ann and John, and her older brother Mason. When Ali was 14, her parents separated, and she and her brother continued living with their mother while still maintaining contact with their father. The divorce left Ali feeling hurt and resentful towards her dad for leaving. She attended Spring High School, where she was popular among her classmates, and actively participated in various extracurricular activities, including softball, choir, and Girl Scout meetings. Allie cherished moments with friends, often hosting dinner gatherings and sleepovers. Although she enjoyed socializing, she was also content with spending time alone, engaging in hobbies like listening to music, drawing, painting, and reading. As she turned 16, Allie sought a part-time job to bring in some extra money while still in school. She landed a position at the nearby Burger Barn, Although her mother initially had concerns about her walking to work without a car, Joanne eventually agreed, with the condition that Allie only worked when she, her dad, or her grandmother could drop her off and pick her up. On April 26, 2010, Allie texted her mother at around 2.30 p.m., stating that she planned to go to the burger barn to pick up her paycheck. Joanne wasn't entirely comfortable with her going, but Allie assured her she would be careful, and Joanne agreed that she could go. She boarded the school bus and later got off at the Low Ridge Road stop, a mile away from work. After that moment, she vanished without a trace. Worried and unable to reach her daughter, Joanne contacted the burger barn, only to discover that they had not seen Ali that day. Concerned for her daughter's safety, Joanne called the police, who launched a search effort that involved the entire community. Flyers were distributed, search teams scoured the area with sniffer dogs, and her image was displayed all over town. However, no leads or clues surfaced, leaving her disappearance a baffling mystery. In 2012, a woman from Columbus, Ohio, claimed to have seen a girl resembling Allie at a church event. Following this lead, Allie's family and a private detective embarked on an undercover mission in the area, searching for her in crack houses and brothels. While they were able to save eight girls from the raid, Allie was not among them, and the girl said to resemble her turned out not to be her after all. The detective did speak with a sex worker named Amy, who confirmed knowing Allie as Alicat and revealed details about a scar on her forehead, a detail unknown to the public. Amy claimed Allie was a victim of human trafficking, and the family strongly believes she is still alive but unable to escape whoever is keeping her. Despite the family's unwavering hope, Alexandria Lowitzer remains missing, leaving her loved ones yearning for her safe return. Anyone with information is urged to contact the Harris County Sheriff's Office at 713-221-6000. Number 8. The Disappearance of Nicholas Barkley Born on December 31, 1980, Nicholas Barkley grew up in a troubled environment. His single mother, Beverly, battled substance addiction and worked night shifts, leaving him and his older brothers, Carrie and Jason, to fend for themselves at home. Nicholas's early life was marked by behavioral issues and run-ins with the law resulting from stealing, truancy, and threatening behavior. His relationship with his mother and older brother Jason was strained due to their own struggles with addiction and volatile behavior. Despite attempts to address these issues by having Jason move back in with the family to help with Nicholas, the situation only worsened, leading to domestic disturbances and frequent police visits. On June 14, 1994, 13-year-old Nicholas was facing a court appearance that could have resulted in him being sent to a group home, something he was vehemently opposed to. The day before the court date, he went to play basketball at a nearby park and later called home to ask if his mother would pick him up. He spoke with Jason on the phone, who instructed him to walk back home alone. Tragically, Nicholas never made it and was reported missing by Beverly on June 13, 1994. Law enforcement initially treated the case as a runaway, given Nicholas's history of truancy and of leaving home for short periods. Unfortunately, this delayed the launch of a more intensive search effort, and precious time was lost in the crucial early stages of the investigation. Despite the efforts of family and friends to find him, Nicholas remained missing for several years. The case took a bizarre turn in September 1997, when a young man came forward claiming to be Nicholas Barkley. French con artist Frédéric Bourdain lived with the Barclay family for several months 
until a documentarian who was filming the family to tell their story noticed that Bourdain's ears differed from the way Nicholas's ears appeared in old photos. It soon came to light that the young man was actually Bourdain, and he was jailed for passport fraud and perjury. Shockingly, after his release and return to his native France, he ended up impersonating another missing boy in an effort to deceive his family. However, the case took another tragic turn when Nicholas's brother, Jason, died from an overdose shortly after Bourdain's arrest. This fueled speculation that Jason might have been involved in Nicholas's disappearance and death, perhaps accidentally or deliberately. Some also suspected Beverly, given her struggles with addiction and difficulty managing her youngest son's behavior, may have played a role. The case has left many unanswered questions and has been clouded by the sensationalism surrounding the imposter Frederick Bourdain. The focus on the con artist has often overshadowed the memory of the 13-year-old boy who never returned home. The truth about what happened to Nicholas Barclay may never be fully known, and the case remains one of the haunting unsolved mysteries in recent history. Today, Nicholas would be 42 years old. The San Antonio Police Department are still receiving tips at 210-207-7484 if you or anyone you know has information about this case. Number 7, Room 1046. On January 2, 1935, Roland Owen checked into Room 1046 at the Hotel President in Kansas City under a false name. His odd behavior, including keeping the room dark and appearing nervous around hotel staff, was suspicious in retrospect, but the staff did not pay him much mind. He claimed to be from Los Angeles and had a distinctive scar and cauliflower ear. During his stay, Hotel staff reported hearing strange conversations in his room and witnessed unusual interactions. On January 3rd, a water department employee encountered a disheveled man who seemed agitated and threatened to harm someone for a scratch on his arm. The following day, a bellboy found Owen naked and severely injured in his room. He was covered in blood and showed signs of including a fractured skull and stab wounds. Injuries to his neck and wrists also indicated that he had apparently been bound by some kind of rope or cord. Despite being semi-conscious, he claimed to have hit his head on a bathtub. Tragically, Owen slipped into a coma and died later that night. After searching the room, investigators found no clues pointing towards what had transpired that day. The murder weapon was never recovered, and it soon became clear that Roland Owen was an assumed name. Authorities struggled to identify the man known as Roland Owen until he was eventually tentatively identified as Artemis Ogletree, a missing teenager from Alabama, thanks to his distinctive cauliflower ear. Though there has never been any confirmation of this fact, investigators were willing to accept it as there were no leads pointing anywhere more concrete. The circumstances surrounding the man in room 1046's death have given rise to various theories. Some speculate that he may have been involved in illegal activities, such as gambling, or that it could have been a crime of passion involving a spurned lover named Louise, or a man named Don. Names Owen was heard mentioning when speaking on the phone. Adding to the mystery, letters allegedly sent by Ogletree to his mother from Egypt were found, some dated after his death, raising further questions about the timeline of events. In 2003, a potential lead emerged when an anonymous individual contacted a librarian with information related to the man's death. However, the person refused to provide the crucial piece of evidence, leaving the case unsolved to this day. The case of Roland Owen remains one of the most chilling and enigmatic mysteries in history, with many unanswered questions surrounding his death and the events leading up to it. Number 6. The Disappearance of the Flannan Isles Lighthouse Keepers on December 15, 1900, the Archter, a transatlantic steamer, passed by the Eilean Moor Lighthouse on its way to Leith in Scotland. To their surprise, the lighthouse was dark, prompting a report to the Northern Lighthouse Board three days later. On December 26, the Hesperus, a lighthouse tender ship, arrived for a routine visit. The keepers were nowhere to be seen. Joseph Moore, the relieving keeper, went to investigate and found the lighthouse empty. The beds were made and everything was in order, except for an open kitchen gate, suggesting an abrupt departure. Concerned, Moore returned to the Hesperus, and more crewmen confirmed the unsettling scene. An investigation began, and Superintendent Robert Muirhead visited on December 29th. The east landing seemed undisturbed, but the west showed signs of trouble, with debris strewn about as is common after a large storm. The logbook indicated the keepers were on duty until December 15th, but beyond that, the circumstances were inscrutable. The lighthouse's clock had stopped, and while two keepers had left in appropriate attire, one had apparently left his coat behind. 
Speculation and superstition circulated, fueled by a purported logbook with strange entries that were later debunked as fake. Some suspicions pointed to a history of violence in one keeper, William MacArthur, suggesting violence or murders. However, no conclusive evidence supported any of these theories. The prevailing belief is that a tragic accident took place during a storm, the keepers might have ventured to secure something on the west landing and were swept away by a powerful wave. MacArthur, upon discovering their absence, could have met the same fate while searching for them. The enigma of the Eileen Moore Lighthouse Keeper's disappearance remains unsolved to this day. We seem to stand for an endless while, though still no word was said. Three men alive on Flannan Isle, who thought on three men dead. Wilfred Wilson Gibson, 1912. Number 5. The Disappearance of Treveline Evans Treveline Evans and her husband Richard were living together happily in the charming town of Langollen, North Wales, in 1990. She was a loving mother to her son, a proud grandma, and a passionate antique collector at the age of 52. She realized a lifetime dream by founding her own antique store, Attic Antiques, close to the town core, and was known as an enthusiastic and helpful proprietor. Treveline and Richard were in the process of renovating their brand new summer home in Rudland in June of that year. As she helped out with the repairs and took care of the garden, Treveline was optimistic about the future and shared her joy with loved ones. On June 14, 1990, Treveline was spotted speaking with two men, one older and one younger, outside her shop at about 9.15 a.m. The next day, it was noted that the same men were seen once again in the area outside the store, Described as distinguished looking and immaculately dressed in a navy suit, the older man carried a black briefcase. Later that same day, a couple noticed Treveline standing in the doorway of a cafe, holding a piece of paper and seemingly looking for someone. The following day, June 16th, was a fateful one. Treveline arrived at Attic Antiques around 9.30 a.m. and parked her blue Ford Escort about 200 yards away. With the town center bustling, approximately 25 people stopped by the store that morning, making it another busy day. Treveline appeared content and at ease, even mentioning that she and a friend would be attending a party later that evening. However, around 12.40 p.m., Treveline left a note on the shop's door with a simple message, back in two minutes. Those minutes, unfortunately, turned into hours and Treveline never returned to her store. She vanished without a trace, leaving behind distraught loved ones and a haunting mystery. At 1 p.m., she was spotted buying some fruit, and then at 2.30 p.m., the last confirmed sighting had her walking back towards her shop. However, subsequent sightings have left investigators puzzled, as her whereabouts between buying the fruit and heading back to work remain unclear. When her family started searching for her, they found the shop locked with her belongings inside, including her makeup compact, handbag, credit cards, car keys, jacket, and even flowers she intended to take home. A comprehensive search ensued with investigators eliminating over 1,500 individuals as suspects, but shockingly, there have been no transactions from Treveline's bank account since her disappearance. Despite multiple alleged sightings being reported as far away as Australia, as well as an investigation by Interpol in France, no concrete leads have emerged. Even the consideration of a potential connection to serial killer Robin Legas was eventually ruled out. Treveline's son Richard tragically passed away from a heart attack in his late 30s, leaving her husband Richard to endure the torment of her unsolved disappearance until he passed away in 2015. Now, her younger brother Len Davies holds on to the hope that one day, the truth about his sister's vanishing act will finally come to light, bringing closure to the 33-year mystery. If you have any information about the disappearance of Treveline, please contact the North Wales Police at 01978 290222 or anonymously with Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Number 4. The Disappearance of the Jack Family On a warm summer evening in Prince George, British Columbia, in 1989, 26-year-old Ronnie Jack decided to take a break from the financial struggles he and his family were facing and blow off steam drinking in a pub nearby. After losing his job due to a back injury, Ronnie, his wife Doreen, and their two young children, Russell and Ryan, were barely making ends meet on welfare. But on that evening, it seemed Ronnie's luck was about to change when he walked into the First Leader pub. At the pub, Ronnie encountered a mysterious man who approached him and offered him and Doreen a potential job opportunity at a ranch or logging camp near Klukol's Lake. The couple saw this as a chance to escape their financial woes and provide a better future for their children. 
Excited about the prospect of a fresh start, Ronnie contacted his brother at 11.16 p.m. to share the exciting news of the camp job. He called his parents in Burns Lake two hours later to share the news and let them know of their plans to be home before their children need to be back at school. However, during the phone call with his mother, Ronnie made a haunting comment to his mother saying, if you don't hear from me, come looking. His mother hoped that he was merely joking and tried to push any negative thoughts out of her mind, wishing her son luck in his new endeavor. At 1.21 a.m. on August 2, 1989, neighbors saw Ronnie, Doreen, Russell, and Ryan leaving their home and climbing into the mysterious man's dark-colored pickup truck. It was the last time anyone ever saw them. 23 days later, on August 25, 1989, a missing persons report was filed for the entire family since friends and family had not heard from them. However, with a lack of leads and evidence, the police were at a loss as to where to even begin searching. Nearly seven years after the family were last seen, an anonymous call was made to the police with a chilling message. The Jack family are buried in the south end of Inaudible Ranch. Despite efforts to trace the caller's identity, the lead remained unresolved. Over the years, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police tirelessly pursued answers. They conducted interviews, gathered documents, and searched properties, but the fate of the Jack family remained elusive. In 2019, a more recent search occurred on the Sayuku's First Nation Reserve using advanced techniques, but no clues were found. The main suspect in the case was the mysterious man who offered Ronnie the job at the First Leader Pub. Witnesses provided descriptions, but his identity remains unknown. In spite of the community's support and the relentless efforts of law enforcement, the case of the missing Jack family remains unsolved. The disappearance of Ronnie, Doreen, Russell, and Ryan Jack continues to haunt Prince George, leaving unanswered questions and a sense of mystery that endures to this day. Despite the three decades since they were last seen, the fate of the Jack family and the identity of the enigmatic man from the First Leader pub remain shrouded in mystery. If you know anything about the disappearance of this deeply missed family, you can contact Prince George's RMCP at 250-561. 3300, or if you wish to remain anonymous, you can call Canadian Crime Stoppers at 1 800 222 8477. Number 3 The Disappearance of Sarah Benford. Born in 1986, Sarah Benford was never afforded much of a head start in life. Growing up in a troubled household in Kettering, England, Sarah grew up with her mother Vicky Benford, stepfather Gavin, and her siblings Josh and Anya. She began skipping school at just five years old, drawing the attention of social services from a young age. Her challenges only intensified as she entered her teenage years, and she began to engage in drug use and, and would frequently run away from home. Social services intervened for her own safety and made efforts to place her into care homes, though she regularly absconded from these as well. On April 6, 2000, after a heated argument with her mother, 14-year-old Sarah disappeared without a trace. She made a distressing call to her mother, admitting to using heroin and refusing to return to Welford House, where she had been staying. Her mother called the police for help, but they declined to respond as Sarah was a chronic runaway. Shortly after that call, Sarah vanished, leaving behind her diaries and personal items and only leaving with the clothes on her back. The police initiated an investigation, suspecting foul play, but any leads and reported sightings yielded no definitive answers. Sarah's family accused the police of not taking the teen's disappearance as seriously as they should have because of who she and her family were. Hearing their pleas, the media began to advocate for a more thorough investigation and campaigned tirelessly against the police to treat the case more seriously. This relentless pursuit exposed the gaps in the initial search and emphasized the need to diligently investigate every missing persons case, even in cases of potential runaways and substance users. Over the years, different police departments got involved, resulting in eight arrests in connection with the case. However, no charges have ever been filed in relation to Sarah's disappearance. In November 2021, nearly two decades after Sarah was last seen, a new tip led Northamptonshire police to conduct an extensive excavation in the Valley Walk area near the River Eyes. The tip suggested that Sarah's body might be buried there, with experts, dogs, flyovers, and surveys. They hoped to uncover the truth and bring closure to her family. Unfortunately, the search yielded no remains or further evidence, leaving the mystery unsolved and her family still searching for answers. As of March 2023, no further leads or suspects have emerged in the case. Detective Superintendent Joe Banfield, who oversaw the investigation, spoke about the recent spate of activity in the case, saying, 
The Dig in the Valley Walk area of Kettering, which was conducted at the end of 2021, was in response to credible information that Sarah may have been buried at that location. Unfortunately, she was not found. Sarah went missing more than 22 years ago now, but we will never give up trying to find her body and potentially tracing her killer or killers. If you're watching this and believe you have information relating to the disappearance of Sarah, please call 101 or Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800-555-111. Sarah, if by any chance you are watching this, we urge you to call missing people on 116. 000 who can offer confidential advice and support. Number 2. The Murder of Eliza Sherman Eliza Sin was born in Cleveland, Ohio to parents who emigrated to America after fleeing the Holocaust in Europe. She grew into a caring and beautiful young woman, connected to her family's Jewish faith, and fueled by a desire to help others, began attending nursing school. While studying there, she met Sanford Sherman and quickly fell in love. However, things were not perfect for long. After starting a family, Stanford began to show a different side of his personality. He was mean and controlling and had extramarital affairs. In 2011, Eliza decided to divorce Sanford to seek a better life for her and her children. The divorce process was difficult, and she faced financial and legal challenges. Eliza hired a prominent attorney, Joe Stafford from Stafford & Stafford Law Firm, on the recommendation of a close friend who'd had him handle his own divorce case. Known for handling high-profile divorce cases, the firm's reputation appealed to Eliza, who believed it would provide an advantage in her situation. Shortly after receiving the divorce papers from Eliza, Sanford retaliated by filing a complaint against her. Throughout this, he continued to pressure Eliza to attend counseling and give their marriage another shot, but she stood firm. Eliza confided in her lawyer, expressing her belief that Sanford's attempts were merely manipulative tactics and that he would not change his controlling and abusive behavior. Both Eliza and Sanford were reluctant to leave their shared home, fearing that it could be viewed as abandonment in court proceedings. As a result, Eliza moved into a downstairs bedroom, attempting to create some space between them. Feeling increasingly unsafe, Eliza began documenting her concerns and emails sent to herself. In one chilling message from January 2012, she expressed genuine fear, writing, I'm really afraid he is going to have me killed. Despite friends offering her a safe haven in their homes until the situation was resolved, Eliza declined their offers. Instead, she took other precautions to ensure her safety, installing a deadbolt on her bedroom door to lock it at night. Things took another turn in March 2012, when Joe Stafford's law license was suspended for a year due to his actions during another case. As a result, Eliza's case was transferred to Gregory Moore, a senior associate in the firm, to move forward with the divorce proceedings. On March 26, 2013, Eliza planned to meet Gregory at the Stafford and Stafford offices, she messaged her daughter Jennifer to inform her of her plans. However, Jennifer was engrossed in a long study session and had silenced her phone, causing her to miss the message for hours. Before heading to Moore's office, Eliza also contacted her childhood friend Jan Lash to let her know about the meeting. Jan offered to accompany Eliza, but she declined, expressing her confidence that she could handle the meeting on her own. Arriving at her lawyer's office at 55 Airyview Plaza around 5.30 p.m., Eliza carried a box of requested documents. To her dismay, she found the building door locked. Frustrated, she texted Moore and waited downstairs for him to let her in. Moore assured her he would be down soon. Eliza sent Moore another message after a short while, this time citing the cold and her decision to wait in her car. Moore replied and said he would be there soon, but their scheduled meeting never came. A few minutes after the messages were exchanged, Eliza was viciously attacked by an unidentified assailant who sneaked up behind her and stabbed her 11 times, eight times in the back, twice in the neck, and once in the arm. Despite the man's desperate efforts to aid her, Eliza's strength waned, and she eventually lay down on the sidewalk. Paramedics, alerted by the 911 call, arrived promptly, but tragically, Eliza was pronounced dead at Metro Health Medical Center at 6.14 p.m. The police immediately launched a thorough investigation to find her killer. The first crucial piece of evidence was CCTV footage captured near the crime scene. The footage showed a hooded man with a noticeable limp running away from the area shortly after the attack. This individual was wearing jeans and a green jacket. Despite releasing the CCTV footage to the public and conducting extensive interviews, no significant leads emerged in the initial stages of the investigation. The police faced the daunting task of connecting the dots between Eliza's troubled marriage, the messy divorce proceedings, and the motive behind her murder. 
During the investigation process, Aliza's lawyer, Gregory Moore, came under suspicion due to his behavior and involvement in the case. Eliza had voiced her concerns about Moore being rude, indifferent, and often late for crucial meetings and filings related to her case. The attorney-client relationship was fraught with tension, and Eliza's lack of trust in Moore became evident. However, despite the suspicions surrounding Moore, forensic analysis of his phone placed him nowhere near the crime scene at the time of the attack. The police had to look elsewhere for potential suspects. Another key figure in the investigation was Sanford Sherman, Aliza's estranged husband. The police discovered a web of complex financial transactions and concealed finances related to their divorce. Over $1 million had been transferred from their joint accounts to Sanford's private accounts, raising eyebrows about his financial motives. Disturbingly, Aliza had emailed herself expressing fear that Sanford might have her killed. These emails provided insight into the troubled dynamics of their relationship and the dangers she felt she was facing. Additionally, Sanford's alleged involvement in illicit affairs and strip clubs raised concerns about his character and potential motives for wanting Eliza dead. His embezzlement of money from Eliza's accounts further incriminated him in the eyes of her family. Perhaps the most compelling piece of evidence was their daughter Jennifer Sherman's deposition against her father. Jennifer accused Sanford of embezzling around $2 million from her mother's accounts. A forensic accountant's investigation revealed that Sanford used the embezzled money for various expenses, including strip clubs and gifts and dates for his affair partners. The police developed a theory that Sanford might have paid off Gregory Moore to set a trap for Eliza. With a critical court hearing related to their divorce scheduled just two days before her murder, Sanford might have been deeply concerned about potential losses in the proceedings or worried that his embezzlement might come to light. Despite mounting evidence against Sanford, a judge ruled that there was no concrete evidence indicating he was guilty of the crime, preventing the police from bringing criminal charges against him for Eliza's murder. To this day, the case remains unresolved, leaving Jennifer and her family devastated and without the closure they sought. Anyone with information about Eliza's murder can call Crime Stoppers of Cuyahoga County at 216-252-7463. Number 1. The Springfield Three 19-year-old Suzanne Streeter and 18-year-old Stacy McCall's graduation day from Kickapoo High School in Springfield, Missouri, was filled with anticipation and excitement as they eagerly planned to celebrate their milestone achievement together. The two blonde best friends had big plans for the night. They were planning to attend multiple graduation parties with classmates. The following day, they were set to embark on a thrilling adventure to a water park, joined by a group of friends and fellow graduates. However, fate had something different in mind for Suzanne and Stacy. As the evening went on, the duo made their way to their friend Janelle Kirby's house, where further celebrations were happening. They were originally planning to stay the night there, but around 2 a.m., the girls realized that Janelle didn't really have the room for them and decided to return to Suzanne's house to sleep before they all reunited the next day. The next morning, when Suzanne and Stacy failed to show up at Janelle's house for a ride to the water park, concern quickly set in. Janelle and her boyfriend drove over to the house Suzanne shared with her mother, 47-year-old Cheryl Levitt. But as they arrived, an eerie scene awaited them. They quickly noticed that the front porch light was broken, with shattered glass scattered across the porch. Curiously, only the globe encasing the bulb was damaged, leaving the bulb itself intact. Janelle's boyfriend Mike swept up the glass, thinking nothing more of it. It was only after the fact that investigators realized that this kind gesture may have, in fact, destroyed important evidence. In front of the house, they noticed the cars of all three women parked, but something caught their attention. Suzanne's car, which she usually parked in the same spot every day, was pulled up elsewhere. This raised questions. Had someone else been parked there when Suzanne and Stacy arrived, preventing Suzanne from parking in her usual space? Inside the house, a strange and unsettling emptiness greeted them. The front door stood unlocked, yet Suzanne, Stacy, and Cheryl were nowhere to be found. All they saw were the women's purses and Cheryl's dog Cinnamon, who seemed agitated. Janelle assumed they had just missed Suzanne, Stacy, and Cheryl, believing that they had already left for the water park. However, as they were about to leave, an unexpected phone call interrupted the silence. Janelle answered and the male voice on the other end made lewd remarks before Janelle hung up the phone. The same caller tried again, making innuendos over the line before Janelle once again hung up in disgust. Hoping that the three had already headed out for the water park, Janelle and her boyfriend left, believing that they would reunite with their friends in a few hours and still enjoy the day's activities together. However, when there was no sign of them, Janelle became even more worried. 
Stacy's mom, Janice, became worried when she had also not heard from her daughter and ended up heading to Suzanne and Cheryl's home to look for her. When she realized her daughter's car was parked out front, she went to the house to investigate. While there, she realized that the clothes her daughter had been wearing the night before were neatly folded in the home. She also saw that there was a new message on the answering machine and playing it back said that it was a strange message. However, in listening to it, it was inadvertently erased. Investigators do not believe that it was linked to the calls that Janelle had received while she was in the home. McCall's parents contacted police while they were still at Suzanne and Cheryl's home, and an extensive investigation was launched. Search efforts expanded across the area, with divers, police dogs, and the FBI joining the search. Despite the collective efforts and media attention, each promising lead seemed to lead to yet another dead end, leaving investigators and loved ones in a state of frustrating uncertainty. Amidst the frenzy of media coverage, the case captured the hearts of the public, with daily updates broadcast in the days following their disappearance. The community yearned for a resolution, for any clue that could unravel the mystery surrounding Suzanne Streeter, Stacy McCall, and Cheryl Levitt. Multiple suspects, including Suzanne's ex-boyfriend and a neighbor, were considered but ultimately cleared due to insufficient evidence. A witness's account of a green van with a blonde woman visible inside provided a glimmer of hope, but it too failed to yield concrete results. Years passed, and the case went cold, leaving the once vibrant hopes for resolution dimmed by the passage of time. Even a 2007 tip that prompted ground-penetrating radar scans of a parking garage offered no conclusive breakthrough. Now, more than three decades later, the Springfield Three's disappearance remains a haunting enigma, a tragic tale of lives seemingly swallowed by the void. The memories of Suzanne Streeter, Stacy McCall, and Cheryl Levitt endure in the hearts of their loved ones, forever etched in the minds of a community that refuses to forget. The quest for answers continues, with the hope that one day, the truth behind their inexplicable vanishing will finally come to light. The case remains open to this day, and anyone with information into the disappearance of Suzanne, Stacy, and Cheryl can contact the Springfield Police Department at 417-864-1751 or the FBI VICAP at 800-634-4097.